So now I want to continue this uh, set of lectures and I'll finish them uh, by uh, computing all these observables in SU2 gauge theory with four fundamental hypers. And then uh, with us, well, and at the same time in SU2 gauge theory with uh, uh, an adjoint hyper. And we'll see the connection to integrability, to the equations, TT star geometry. That's the topic of the last lecture. I will not present uh, the subject for uh, other gauge groups. I'll just mention a few of the open questions and uh, ideas and results in that field. So since I want to get to the interesting things quicker, um, what I'll do is uh, the path that I chose in the presentation. So here I gave you a derivation. I mean, I gave you sort of an overview of a derivation through the trace anomaly for this basic relation. One of the tests that we, one of the tests that you should run on this basic relation, on this relation, is exactly what we discussed at length um, in the previous session, which is that this is invariant under Keller transformations. So this is invariant under this uh, holomorphic functions that the partition functions are ambiguous by. So the path that I am choosing to giving you the most general solution for the extremal correlators is not by deduction. I'm not going to give you a proof. Though there are some proofs in the literature. I'm just going to give you a formula, and then you can try to check by yourself that it's actually uh, invariant under holomorphic times anti-holomorphic uh, ambiguities. So, so the, the idea is the following. So the idea is to generalize this, this formula. So this will be our starting point, and we'll, I'll just, I'm just going to write an expression that generalizes that formula, and it would give the answer to these uh, observables. So the first step is that you construct a huge matrix M and M, which, uh, well, up to some, which consists of uh, essentially derivatives of the partition function. So we have the partition function in the denominator, and then we have N derivatives with respect to tau and M derivatives with respect to tau bar. Okay. So you construct such a huge matrix M. Okay, it's an infinite matrix in principle. The matrix of the, it's a ma the matrix, so there is one here. And then there is d tau of z over z. Then there is d tau bar of z over z. And then there is d tau, d tau bar of a z over z, and so on. So, you can observe, uh, it's a silly little observation, that G2 was essentially the determinant over the two by two block on the upper left corner, of the upper half, of upper left corner of this matrix. So the determinant of that is exactly G2. Is that okay? Oh, a factor of 16, you mean? Wait, just a second. Did, what did I do? There is a small discrepancy, indeed. So, what is the discrepancy? Can you tell me again? What? One over Z. Maybe it will be useful if I if I write this as a z over z. Then when you take the determinant, clearly as, as z squared pulls out and you're, it's the same. No? Yeah. <coughs> so it's, I claim it's the same. Okay? So the idea, is the, the formula is the following, right? The claim, I'm not going to derive this claim. It's, uh, I'm going to just uh, t tell you what are the consequences and the, and the structures that arise from this. So G2N has a silly like normalization factor in front here. 
This is just uh, generalizing this uh, 16 that we had in that. And then what you do is you take the determinant of the n by n upper left block and divide by the determinant of the n minus 1 upper left block. And that's it. This is the idea. Well, this is the formula. It's very nice, uh, very nice and very neat. OK? So this reduces to the formula for G2 that we had before. Now, an exercise for you, those who are uh, this is a this is a really nice exercise. To I mean, it shows uh, that this is quite a miraculous formula. So, as we discussed many times, the partition function is not actually an observable. You can shift it by uh, a holomorphic times an anti plus an anti-holomorphic function. So. This is a purely holomorphic function, and this is a purely anti-holomorphic function. So you can check that uh, this is invariant under this uh, transformation, <coughs> which is extremely non-trivial exercise, but technical. It's a technical non-trivial exercise. So G2n is invariant. This is a very non-trivial property of this uh, construction. So that's, of course, necessary if what you want to construct is an actual observable. I think um, I messed something up a little bit with the indices n. So dn is the determinant of the 2n by 2n block, not n by n block. OK? Yeah, the n is the determinant of the 2n by 2n block. Block on the upper, upper left corner. OK, so I'm not going to prove this formula. It's just uh, I'm just uh, giving this formula as as a fact. And now, sh now we'll see that uh, this leads to some very interesting properties for these two-point functions in flat space. So this is supposed to be a formula to compute two-point functions of ex extremal correlators in flat space. And as I remarked, if we knew G2n, we know all the extremal correlators. So with this formula, in principle, you know everything. Uh, amazingly, there is a recursion relation. between the various G2Ns. OK, there is, I don't know why there is such a recursion relation, but there is a recursion relation between the different G2Ns. So in some sense, they are not entirely independent. And this recursion relation is what's known as Clity star geometry. A, a property of this recursion relation is that it's an integrable, you can think about it as an integrable, integrable system which we're going to see soon. So inside every n equals 2, superconformal filter, uh, this is general, in fact. This is, these are general facts, not just for SU2. So in, inside every n equals 2 superconformal filter, the Coulomb branch operators obey the recursion relations of some TT star geometry, and they're always an integrable system. In some cases, this integrable system can be identified with a classical integrable system that is in you know, textbooks. And in some cases, uh, we don't know what this integrable system is. So a small exercise, this is easier than that exercise, is that you can check the d tau, d tau bar of the logarithm of this dn obeys the following equation, dn plus 1, dn minus 1, dn squared minus n plus 1, d1. So the, these are these determinants, and they obey this differential equation, relating various components of these determinants. This is not uh, terribly hard to show. So that. 
that can be rewritten in a slightly more suggestive form, this differential equation. So this follows just from the definitions that I've given you. It's not, there is nothing more to that. So to understand the meaning of this differential equation, it's useful to change variables a little bit. Can you just pick up a little bit? Uh, these properties of integrability are these in general in four dimensions. Any n equals to a CFT in four dimensions. So uh, integrable systems could be very complicated. It doesn't mean that it's straightforward. In some cases, it's not even easy to identify them, right? But you can just prove that there is a lax pair and you know these formal properties. So there is a change of variables that allows to uncover the meaning of this uh, uh, differential equation. So you rewrite dn in terms of an exponential of some qn. You just take the logarithm of dn, essentially, minus the logarithm of the force sphere partition function. And there is some factor of 16 that I'm carrying around for some conventions. So you do this change of variables. And then this differential equation in terms of the QNs uh, looks a little bit more familiar. So the differential equation in terms of the QNs, after you do the change of variables, becomes d tau d tau bar QN is e to the QN plus 1 minus QN minus e to the QN minus QN minus 1. And this equation is familiar from the literature on integrability. This is called the Toda equation. I'll, ch I'll explain what it means now. It's called the Toda equation. So here, this Toda equation lives in a space which is totally different from uh, maybe the other Toda equations that you've seen. So there is one Toda system in AGT that describes uh, uh, something completely different. Then there is a Toda system that lives on the cyber witten curve that also describes something completely different. This Toda equation lives in the space of extremal correlators. So it's a recursion relation for extremal correlators in some sense. So you can think about this Toda chain as saying that points, which are like masses, so imaginary the imaginary part of tau plays the role of time. So you can think about it as Newton's second law Ignoring for a second, the re if you ignore for a second the real part of tau, which I'll, I'll make a comment about it, just ignore for a second the real part of tau, then this looks like uh, q dot dot equals something. So you can interpret it as a chain of masses with some springs. So this is the boundary. So this is like a, a, a half infinite chain of masses and springs. And the force between two nearby uh, springs and nearby masses is given by this. So this is like a half infinite Toda chain. So this is half infinite. But the meaning of these uh, sites is like uh, extremal correlators. So this is the extremal correlator for that gives the Zama logic of metric. This is the extremal correlator for the next element in the chiral ring, like O three O three dagger, <laughs> then O four O four dagger, and so on. So this is like an evolution. This is like an equation uh, that allows you to evolve in time or in evolving tau the different extremal correlators. Now this kind of system of oscillators is exactly solvable. Given the boundary conditions. So this is exactly solvable given the boundary conditions. The boundary conditions sit here. So somebody is just, uh, somebody is uh, oscillating this mass and this sends some waves down this chain. And this is a sol solvable system. So this is like a solid on an Toda chain. And given the, given the forcing uh, on, the, on the open end of the Toda chain, uh, you can determine everything. So it's a solvable, it's, yeah, it's a classically solvable equation. And if you open the integrability literature, how do people solve such a Toda chain? They write the solution in terms of ratios of determinants. How surprising. So yeah, so it's a, <laughs> the solution is written as a ratio of determinants. Okay, so anytime you see ratios of determinants, you should immediately say integrability. The, in many, 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 many integrable systems can be solved by ratios of determinants.
<coughs> so now let me just make a comment about the meaning of the real part of tau. The real part of tau is absent in the classical Toda system, it's just like there is time and it's like Newton's second law. So the real part of tau is a compact variable, so you can Fourier transform in the real part of tau, and that effectively just adds another index. So in fact, what we have is the lattice of Toda chains. And the interpretation of this uh, vertical direction is what? Can somebody say? So what is the physical interpretation of this direction? This is instant on number. So there is like a Toda chain for each instant on sector. And, they, and this equation means that they don't talk to each other. Because you can just, uh, um, the, the, the if you go to Fourier space, then it's, uh, then it's sort of diagonal. So we have a lattice, of, a lattice that is a slight generalization of the Toda chain, where the additional coordinate has to do with the cosine theta uh, dependence of the, of the partition function, of, of the extremal correlators. OK. So this, uh, this is the complete solution of SU2, of the uh, chiral ring of SU2 gauge theory with four hypers. These equations are true both in n equals 4 and in SU2 with four hypers. It's, it's, that, it's just that like in, S, in n equals 4, the initial condition is trivial. So n equals 4 super young Mills theory is only different from SU2 with four hypers in this language by the initial conditions. So the initial conditions are just trivial, and the wave is trivial, and everything is tree level exact. In SU2 gauge theory, the the initial condition is non-trivial, the Toda wave is not trivial, and all these things have an interesting perturbative and non-perturbative contributions. So the equation is the same for the two theories, but the solutions in one case, in one case the solution is just trivial, and in the other case the solution is a, a very non-trivial. Yeah. How can I perform for the was strong in the linear can you say again? It is strong and nonlinear. How, how we can perform Fourier here? Well, uh, the question is, it's a, the question is, it's strongly nonlinear. So how can uh, you do Fourier, right? I was just saying that you can, uh, because the real tau is a circle, you can, uh, you can, in, you can just trade the derivatives. You can diagonalize the derivatives in real tau. So there is one direction which is non-compact. That's the time direction. And then there is one direction where all the dependence is periodic. So you can just expand everything in cosines. And the exponents as well. Right. So it's not that they are completely decoupled, but the meaning of these these different layers of the chain. But they are strongly coupled. You could say that they are coupled. Okay. Yeah. But the system is still solvable by the same techniques of Toda integrability. So this is a mild, uh, this is lattice Toda, this like kind of lattice Toda is just a very mild generalization of Toda, of the, of the classical chain, because it can essentially solve for the other direction with no cost. It, it, you just take the usual solution and you add another uh, direction and it's still a solution. So in some vague sense it's decoupled, but I agree that technically it's not. Okay, so. In fact, one interesting open question is that um, if, you look at the, if you look at these two-point functions, O and O and dagger, and if you take n to be very large, uh, let's say n, going n much bigger than 1, then the techniques of effective field theory should work because it's like a heavy operator. And this, should be, this can be analyzed using the large R charge technique of Hellermann et al. So you can analyze these special cases by the large R charge technique. And it would be interesting to try to understand what this means in that, in that sense. So this is like the behavior very far down the chain. So the ideas of effective field theory of Hellermann et al. implied that very far down the chain here, uh, there is some kind of universal behavior that is true in any QFT, even, uh, those, ones, even those ones that we're discussing here which obey the Toda equation. So in general, quantum field theories, we don't have such a nice equation for correlation functions, for large charge operators. They are intractable. But see here, it's supposed to be controlled by effective field theory. So here, there is some kind of effective field theory regime, which would be nice to interpret using the Toda chain language. OK, now let me, I want to make some comments about other gauge groups and uh, 
Are there any questions about SU2 gauge theories? Any more questions about SU2? And then I'll make a few comments about SU3 gauge theories. Or SUN gauge theories. Okay, so now I'll make some comments about SUN gauge theories. I'll try to think, say, tell, say, say what we know about this uh, aspect of the problem for higher gauge groups. Well, for SUN, let's let's consider SUN plus two n hypers, two n hypers in the fundamental representation. Just to, to, t to bring you up to speed with the literature about what's known about it. So let's, let's start from descri describing the chiral ring. So we still have the scalar phi, which is in the uh, vector multiplet, uh, the scalar in the vector, mu scalar in the vector multiplet, a complex scalar in the vector multiplet. And it is still true that all the chiral ring generators can be constructed by polynomials of phi. So we have trace phi squared. But unlike SU3 gauge theory, we can construct now independent uh, traces uh, all the way to n minus 1. So for SU2 gauge theory, the special thing is that this is the only guy because all the other ones are given by uh, polynomials in that guy. Because if you have a 2 by 2 matrix and you take the trace of the matrix cube, or the matrix to the four, it's expressible in terms of lower powers. But for SUN, there are many, many, there are n, n, n uh, minus one generators. So there are n minus one, yeah, for SUN, there will be n minus one generators. I think this is go, all, goes all the way to n, actually, yeah, uh, to, to capital N. So there are n minus one generators. And any, any operator is constructed out of those. is constructed out of those letters. So those are like the letters in the alphabet and any chiral ring operator is constructed out of these letters. This is just Casimir's, right? Yeah, these are the Casimir's of uh, SU capital N. So in principle, the job of computing extremal correlators is to, co we can just think about it, computing all the two-point functions of uh, any word that is made out of these letters. So for example, you could say, I, I, I would like to compute the two-point function of trace phi squared, trace phi cubed, trace phi bar squared, trace phi bar cubed. That would be a reasonable question to ask as a function of the coupling. Now, how many coupling constants are there here? Again, just one, one complex coupling constant. There is only one gauge group, and therefore, there is only one exactly marginal parameter, which is a, a G and Wilson theta. And as before, the special, the distinguished operator that uh, it corresponds to changing the coupling constant is this, since this has dimension two, so it's exactly marginal. So there is some kind of uh, distinguished uh, operator here. Okay, so what do we know about this theory? So there is a similar formula for with determinants, even though it has more indices. So such a formula still exists. Uh, for all the extremal correlators. I'm not going to tell you in detail, I'm just giving you like a quick, vague introduction to the subject. So, so the generalization of the ratio of the determinants formula exists. And you can prove that it leads to an integrable system. And uh, it's some kind of Toda chain, but it's not really a Toda chain. Because now there are many extremal correlators, you can construct uh, many words, not just powers of trace phi squared. So it's not natural to put them on a single chain now. In fact, there are infinitely many chains, in some sense, all of which are half infinite. And there are complicated interactions. But it's still an integrable system of some sort. It just, as far as I know, it may not have a name. So it's a very complicated uh, system of interacting chains. 
And uh, it's still integrable formally, as I said, as I said but uh, well, we don't know what the name of that system is. So an interesting open question is to identify that integrable system. Another topic which is uh, not completely settled, and, and perhaps it's more important, is that uh, these determinants were made out of derivatives of the partition function, you remember, in SU2. So in SU2, all we needed to know were derivatives of the partition functions. So SU2 was an especially easy, easy case because the determinants consisted of derivatives of partition functions that were already written explicitly by uh, Peston. So in principle, you had all the information to compute anything you want. However, here the determinants contain some elements that are not in Peston's paper. So I'll, I'm going to explain what those elements are. Uh, this is an open problem to try to uh, understand how to include them properly. So you can always deform the Lagrangian of uh, an n equals 2 supersymmetric field theory by the integral of any Coulomb branch operator, let's say ON. So even if the dimension of ON and put some coupling constant, let's say lambda. Uh, so even if the dimension of ON is bigger than 2, it's an OK deformation. It's an irrelevant, per irrelevant deformation in general. It's an irrelevant deformation in general, but it, the power series in lambda should exist. So maybe the theory doesn't exist as a UV complete theory, but the perturbative expansion in lambda, so the perturbative series in lambda should exist. So when we construct these determinants in the general SUN case, because not all the words are made out of just ray phi squared, you also need to know the derivatives of the S4 partition function with respect to various parameters of op irrelevant operators that we could have added to the action if we liked. So we need various derivatives of this sort. How do we include such higher operators into the four sphere partition function? Well, the perturbative part is easy. So uh, the four sphere partition function typically takes the form of an integral over the Cartan. Uh, and then there is some uh, kind of perturbative uh, dependence on A here. And then there is the necros of partition function squared, called the instant on part squared. So including lambda here is trivial, because that amounts to doing some one-loop computation in localization, and that's easy. However, we don't know how to include lambda here. Nobody performed localization in the presence of, of such heavy operators, as far as I know. Perturbative part though is a seg. You have put in a classical part, right? Yes. Uh, excuse me. I meant here uh, you need to add lambda. A to the power n. But one loop will be the same. Yes, you're completely right. I, sh I meant here. But why, just curiosity, why you wouldn't think that, I mean, instant loop part is exactly the same? It's not. It's not. It's not. So, so what do we, so suppose you just want to study these extremal correlators to this. So already the perturbative part is uh, interesting, as I said. There are many aspects of resurgence that uh, can be studied just from the perturbative series. So for the perturbative series, we have all the information that's needed. So these determinants and total chains can be completely understood to all orders in perturbation theory. So, the total, so these uh, integrable systems can be understood to all orders in, Young, in G and Mills. What you need for the determinants are various derivatives of the partition function with respect to lambda at lambda equals 0. So those we have complete control over to all orders in perturbation theory because we can get them from integrals of this part. So we do understand this integrable system to all orders in perturbation theory. So it's not like we don't know anything. There's a huge amount of information here. And there were, ver there were very nice works by Papadodimas and Baggio and Yarkos checking the predictions of this, you know, also making some predictions for this uh, uh, prescription from explicit Feynman diagrams. 
So this thought that these integrable systems are understood to all orders, but since uh, I don't think that this is actually known explicitly, like it's not known how to localize. I, I think it's not explicitly known how to correct the, the non-perturbative part of the partition function in the presence of higher Casimirs. So this is. I, I remember there, there was a paper by Necrosov and Machiavelli. Right, that. right. So Necrosov. They, they also talk about the Toda, but is this something different Toda? It's completely different. So okay. yeah, I'll tell you what is known. So what we want is is what we want is to understand how to deform the omega background partition function by higher Casimirs. So if you want to understand the complete non-perturbative uh, content of these uh, extremal correlators in arbitrary SU and gauge theory, we have to do that. We need to understand how to include higher Casimirs in omega background. Now, for U and gauge theories, it's relatively easy. It seems like a somewhat technical difficulty. Uh, the issue is that it's SUN. So removing the UN seems particularly nasty. I think for UN, there are papers by Nekrosov and Marshakov and Okunkov, and I think the results are somehow, or also Fuchito and Morales, I think the results are sort of uh, implicitly known. But for SUN, you know, it's very hard to get rid of the U1. And it might be a technical difficulty, but it's actually an interesting concrete problem, because if you want to understand completely these extremal correlators, also including the non-perturbative terms, this has to be done. So the, st the state of the art is that in any Lagrangian theory, this the chain, these integrable systems, and all the extremal correlators are understood to all orders in perturbation theory. And in special cases such as SU2, also the non-perturbative content is completely understood. But in general, since we're lacking uh, the, instant, the modification of the instanton part of the partition function in the presence of higher Casimirs for SUN gauge theories, uh, unfortunately, we don't know. So we don't have the instanton contributions to these integrable systems yet. That's sorry, I still confused if you have the Casimirs localization trouble exactly as before. Right. So uh, Maxim's question is why do the Casimirs affect uh, the instant on partition function, right? So you're, right, you're completely right that the supercharge remains the same. You are still going to localize on small instantons, but they, um, they uh, back react. So remember that the instant on partition function depended on GN mills. So if you add these higher Casimirs, they will depend on lambda two. Lambda and GN mills are very similar. From Young mill centers are as as instant on counting parameter, right? Right. But, la but each, in each instant on sector, there will be a non trivial lambda dependence. So it's incorrect to assume that there is no lambda dependence here. Uh, but mathematically, what it will be so typically called a subvolume or characteristic class of modular space of the instantons. Uh, I don't know. But for UN, you can, for example, read uh, there is a paper by Fuchito Morales who present rather concrete formulas for UN gauge groups. Um, and the, for the formulas are not just modifications of the one low part. So there is a modification at any instant on them. I, I don't actually know what it would amount to do that, but uh, this is something that's missing from the story. And so, so that's the state of the art. The extremal correlators are understood to all orders in perturbation theory, in some cases non-perturbatively, but not, not in all cases. However, people have been able to come up with general proofs that the integrable system of extremal correlators, sorry, the system of extremal correlators is always integrable. It's always a ratio of some determinants. And uh, this, is, this has to do with TT star geometry. So this is known for any uh, n equals to superconformal field theory. And uh, more or less, that's it. So, yeah. The integrability fix the modified uh, um, I, I, I would fail to see how. I, I wouldn't know how to do that. You can try to use Borel, uh, Borel uh, business. Borel is probably has some chance, at least of saying something. Um, yeah, I don't know. So even for SU3, this integrable system has not been completely identified because the instantons are not exactly known yet. Uh, 
And of course, for non-Lagrangian theories, there's been uh, almost no progress yet, uh, except for the bootstrap results of, uh, uh, of the Hamburg group. So, so of course, one also wants to venture eventually to non-Lagrangian theories, but uh, that would be a nice starting point to, to complete this program. Okay. Any other questions? Very good, yes, yes indeed. So, very good. So the comment is that we might, that this is known, that, that uh, this is known um, in some limit, which is uh, like the small uh, epsilon limit through the cyber witten prepotential. And indeed, you're right. But uh, for this, since the sphere has like radius one, in some convention, you're ki it's, ki it's not enough. So, so you have some partial information here. We, we do have some partial information about it, but not complete information. Uh, perhaps these tools of effective field theory that I mentioned of large, large charge could be useful because they should really apply independently of the underlying field theory. So they might be able to teach us something. Another comment is that in the AGT correspondence, these higher Casimirs map to WN algebra generators. So that's another possible way to, to continue. So WN symmetry maps to higher Casimirs. That's how the AGT correspondence works. So in particular, the necros of partition functions in the presence of this coefficient lambda should uh, correspond to some uh, partition functions in 2D with some chemical potentials for the WN uh, symmetry. So it's not guaranteed that no, anybody would know how to compute that, but that's another formal. Uh, Sorry, can you say a little bit one more time what you said? How adding, a higher adi adding one of those operators O to the Lagrangian uh, corresponds in AGT to adding some, uh, uh, some uh, chemical potential for the WN charge. So you have some Riemann surface and uh, and you are like pick a cycle, sorry, a non-contractible cycle. You pick a non-contractible cycle, and you wrap some uh, WN. Uh, well, you just put a chemical potential for the WN charge. So now what you are studying is some partition functions of Toda-like theories, or uh, well, Toda CFTs, in the presence of some uh, twists for WN. So, so in principle, it should be possible to compute those objects from uh, that point of view. But uh, that may be. What is turning on these extra coupling constants? That the, the, the well, this coupling constant here yeah. maps to the chemical potential. So you you have some kind of a, you have some kind of a parameter here, which is the chemical potential of the WN charge. So that's how the correspondence works. This is one possible way to approach this uh, subject. I don't know if this is technically the easiest. Any other questions? What about KDV hierarchy which appear in uh, large, large wavelength limit of Toda? Yeah, the question is about what about the KDV hierarchy which appears in the uh, uh, large wavelength limit. So uh, m maybe I'm wrong, but uh, maybe you can remind me. But that has to do with long time behavior, right? Big, big wavelength. Big wavelength. So, well, I don't know the answer. But... Uh, Big, let's see. Well, here the driving force is uh, the driving force of this uh, chain is kind of fixed. So the driving force is fixed. You're talking about the uh, infinite chain, right, from both directions. Here the driving force is fixed, and your job is to find the solution on the chain. So I don't know if there is such a limit, but there is a long time limit, which is interesting. That's the weak coupling expansion limit. Here. Um, I think that there are two interesting limits of these Toda chains. One is the long time limit, which is the weak coupling expansion limit, and the other limit is what I said, large distance limit from the boundary. You might expect that maybe if you are very far from the boundary, it's approximated by a, an infinite Toda chain. And here, the tools of effective field theory at large charge should apply. So that would be also interesting to understand. Any, any final questions? Okay, so I'm done, thanks.